Over to you, Claire. Hello, everyone. Thank you and welcome back. Um, sorry, just getting everybody. Uh, guys, if you could unmute and uh, bring your cameras back online, that would be amazing. And I uh, just want to say hello to everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for this cross uh, creative and photo studio ops discussion um, on culture. And today I am joined by five, excuse me, I'm joined by four amazing people. I am the fifth person. Let me try that one again. Is it the afternoon? I think it is. I didn't have an espresso yet. So if somebody wants to bring that to my door, that'd be great. Um, and Stacy and I are representing for the Striped Shirt Club. Uh, for any of you just joining us and who don't know me, I'm Claire Carter again from Forecast, and I'm a consultant on all things creative and studio ops. And I'd like to welcome our fantastic panelists and ask them to introduce themselves and tell us a little bit about our role. And I'm going to ask uh, Colleen Moore to kick us off, please. Happy to do so. Thanks. Hi, everyone. I am Colleen Moore. I am the senior manager of the media studio at REI. I'm super excited about this forum. I love all things photo studio operations and particularly how culture can make your operations flow so much better. And excited to be joined here with an awesome crew. So I guess I'll pass it back to Claire to have someone else introduce themselves. Fantastic. Let me unmute and try to keep going. Stacy, would you like to? Hi. Hi, I'm uh, Stacy Tyrell. I work as the photo studio and digital ops manager at Christie's uh, North American headquarters here in New York City. And uh, yeah, just really excited to be here. <laughs> awesome. Hoon? Hi, I'm Hoon Kim. I am the content production lead for uh, marketing and creative operations at Airbnb. I'm also part of the core values team um that does a lot of culture uh here at airbnb as well great and scott yeah hi everybody my name's scott i'm a partner at brain writer and we're a creative operations resourcing agency so we get a sneak peek into a whole bunch of different cultures and how different clients are in fact you know bringing culture to life to make their operations run well and, and deliver creative excellence so i'm happy to be part of today's panel Terrific. And thank you all for joining us, uh, both the panelists and those of you uh, who are joining us from the Photo Studio Ops side or the Creative Ops side. So uh, just a little bit of housekeeping before we get started. We're going to chat for a while and then open it up for Q&A. So please submit any questions that you have as we go along that you'd like to ask the panel. And I'm going to save, I personally, we're going to save some time uh, at the end to get through as many as we can. So without further ado, let's get started. So I'm going to kick us off by quoting something that Colleen brought up in her fantastic panel on, excuse me, a session on culture at Photo Studio Ops New York in May, which is what is culture? And I think that this definition really applies to what we're talking about today, which is culture is a set of shared attitudes, values, goals, and practices that characterizes an institution or organization. So that's a little, a little heavy for how much time that we have, but we're gonna talk about as much of it as we can. And I'm hoping that we can also have volume two in person sometime soon. But when we met to discuss and prepare for this panel, one thing that really resonated in our conversation was about how important it is to start at the top when it comes to creating a culture. We can all work hard to positively affect our group's culture, our team's culture and our team's dynamic. But creating a strong and inclusive culture in many ways has to start at the top of the organization. So I'd like to talk a little bit about the importance of a clear company mission and, as Hoon mentioned, core values. So I'd like to kick us off by asking Hoon, since he mentioned it already, what does the term mean to you and your organization? Yeah, I found it really important that um, you know company is very explicit about what the company believes are the core values, and um, and what's what's nice about that, what I found is that um, when you have a shared set of values, you kind of know where everyone stands already, and so it becomes kind of like a shorthand, and you're not kind of discovering, oh, who is this person? Do they have another agenda? Um, and it just kind of strips a, strips off that layer of like, oh, okay, we all have some kind of shared thing. 
everyone's going to be an individual, but there's some shared core values amongst everyone at the company. So it gives you a sense of camaraderie already. And just like one more step in terms of collaboration, because you're, you're, you're all here for a central purpose. And I found that be, to be very important in terms of um, how to quickly do work, but also how to just quickly uh, set up trust with one another. Right. Absolutely. And I think that one of the things that you said, Hoon, I think that is really interesting is when you have those shared values as an organization, you had mentioned that this actually influences your hiring strategies. So that when you're looking for the right people for the right roles, you're also looking for people who will sort of flow into the organization very well. Can you tell us a little bit about that as well? Yeah, so for full-time employees, we um, everyone goes through a functional interview, but we also do a core values interview and um, you have to pass both. Uh, so someone could be amazingly skilled, but if they do not share the core values, then they, they probably will not get hired. Uh, so it's really about um, the way that kind of we talk about it internally is like, a lot of people think of it as a culture fit and it's not really a culture fit. It's more like a culture ad where um, we, we kind of equate it to like pizza where everyone has their own uh, kind of preference of pizza but everyone um, understands what pizza is. But uh, for me, what's exciting is like, if someone goes like, well, yeah, yeah, I love pizza, but have you ever had Indian pizza? I'm like, whoa, I've never thought of Indian pizza. Like that sounds delicious. And so it's, it's adding to the culture, but with the baseline of like, okay, there's some type of bread or dough and there's some kind of toppings. And so you really kind of become more diverse uh, globally in terms of where you're coming from and adding to the culture. Absolutely. And now we're all hungry for pizza. Um, Colleen, I really like to turn to you on this because it was really something that you touched on, as I said, at, at uh, Photo Studio Ops New York. And for any of you who weren't able to attend, I believe that the uh, sessions are up on YouTube now. Uh, visit the Henry Stewart uh, channel or also go to their website. I think there's links to them there. But Colleen, could you talk a little bit about core values and the company mission and what that's meant to you and your organization at REI, which obviously uh, you know, is, is living, living the brand in so many different ways? Yeah, living the brand is living our value and how that supports our mission and our purpose, right? And making the outdoors more accessible for all and um, everything Hoon said really resonated with me, right? Like, how do you find that like baseline where we can all really align to the core values? And I think of those somewhat as like a framework also to frame discussions around and, um, and check in with ourselves and, um, and ask ourselves like, hey, are we really like courageously embracing change in this moment? Do we need to? Is there something we could do um, to do this better? And how does that support the mission um, that we all really are very passionate about? So I think that all brings us together um, you know, to rally around like one mission, one purpose, one set of values, but also like Hoon said to find like, where do we layer things on and where do we find other opportunities, right? To bring in different perspectives and viewpoints and expand upon those values and, and grow um, where we might have blind spots and where we might have opportunities to show up in a better way. And um, gosh, that influences everything. Oh, I think we lost Colleen for a minute, which is too bad because I think she was about to say something really profound. Um, I'm gonna to touch on something that she mentioned. Oh, no, nope, she's back. Okay, it influences us. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, Sorry, technology. Back? You're back. back. You're good. Okay, I'm getting a notice saying my internet connection is unstable for some reason. So I apologize for that. That's the virtual um, world we live in. <laughs> Moral of my story, I think, is that the culture that we create inside the studio really resonates through mm. the imagery that we produce and, mm. and out into like the members that can participate in our co-op and um, really hopefully expand that community. So um, yeah, super meaningful for us in the REI studio. Well, I think you is, and, and you and I have worked together in the past, obviously, and have some history. But I think one of the amazing things about what you're doing is it's not just 
saying we believe in this. It's actually reflected in how you run the studio, the type of talent you have both in front of and behind the camera, and then how you're looking at talent going forward. Um, as everybody who knows me knows, I'm really passionate about talent. And one of the things I think is really interesting about RAI is you're utilizing a lot of members in the photography. So you're telling the story in an authentic way that isn't just, hey, everybody, we have you know, we have some members who also happen to be professional surfboarders or whatever it may be. You actually have real members who are families who are from all walks of life in all areas of the world participating not only in their preferred activities, but doing so in a way that's also bringing more people together and getting more people outside. And it's inspirational. And I think that's amazing because you're you're inspired by it and we're inspired by it. And so if you can be inspired and be inspiring at the same time, I think that's just a magical, magical place to be. And I wanna bring up one other thing before Stacy, I'm gonna turn over to you, is something you mentioned was change. And change management is certainly something that we all think about. And I do think that keeping your culture in mind, change is never easy, let's face it. Implementing a new tool is never easy, we all know that. But if we can keep our culture in mind and our core values as we drive our communication plan or our change management plan, this will help really, I think, um, bring the message home to your teams and your employees in a different way. And as leaders, we don't wanna just say, hey guys, this is come and get ready for it. It's more, mm -hmm. This is coming, let's figure out how we're going to make it happen together. And I think that inclusive culture is something that we're all trying to build. And I think it needs to, again, emanate from the top and be able to, I don't want to say seep, I'm thinking, I'm thinking of the right world, but really be able to percolate into all the different areas of our organizations. Um, so on that note, Stacy, can I turn it over to you to talk a little bit about uh, core values, especially where you are, which is a, a heritage organization, yeah. which has <laughs> hundreds of years of history. And so change has got to be, you know, top of mind too, but tell us a little bit about your experience at Christie's. Um, so like you said, you're dealing, like I'm in an environment where it's a 300 year old company. So there's definitely a very legacy way of doing things. And even I had mentioned in prior conversation, just uh, things being very siloed off in terms of how each department functions. And, um, but what, and I think the pandemic is also um, a very good example of how we were sort of uh, forced into a lot more um, collaboration and also just uh, being open and flexible to certain tools and um, really beginning to have to take a very stark look at just because this is how things were done in the past does it mean this is how we continue to do them in the future or even that that was the correct way of doing things and um, and I, I think that that also speaks to say specifically with my department where um, you know, like we're a contractor that then collaborates with the company to bring our expertise into that section of their business of the business so that then it can actually um, service the rest of the business uh, in a more efficient and also help tell those stories. Uh, so while like there are core values to the organization, I think that, um, it, you know, there's certain things that they're still finding their feet with that um, for, for the better um is what I what I can say about that <laughs> outstanding I mean it's just a really unique situation I mean such a dichotomy between I think Airbnb and Christie's where you have a very young organization who is dealing with a lot of the same opportunities and um let's say challenges but but dealing with okay and I'll say challenges we all know their challenges um but dealing with a lot of these same issues that you're seeing at Christie's which is heritage organization. And I just think that's one of the most amazing things about our community is we have such a diverse group of people in creative ops, design ops, and photo studio ops, but we are all tackling a lot of the same concerns and we can find solutions and learn from each other. So just in the same way that we're creating this incredible culture within our own organizations, we are also creating an incredible culture in this community. And I have to just have a moment and just say, I'm so grateful to this community because I have learned so much and I feel like I've been able to share quite a lot, which has really made me quite happy. And I'm getting a thumbs up from Scott, which means of course, I'm gonna to turn to him next uh -huh. on this. 
And Scott, you have a really interesting perspective too, because you only not you not only have your internal culture at Brain Rider, but you've got the culture and core values of your clients as well, who are really partners. Can you tell us a little bit about what your experience has been with that? Yeah, sure. Yeah, the, our model is really deep partnerships. So we go as far as how we've got about a couple hundred people working across North America, and half of them are embedded at clients as full time contingent workers. So they're really being managed through client workflows and client processes as part of that culture. And so how you blend those two families together is interesting. You, you talked about talent. Now, the, the amazing thing about creative talent is I love them. The challenging thing about creative talent is that they call bullshit really quickly. And so if your values are sort of generic or not useful in what they're doing day to day, they just don't embrace them. In fact, they go the opposite way and they reject them. And so it's taken us a decade really to, to try to get our core values in place that they can serve both the talent and the talent as they're working more deeply with clients. And one of those practical core values that we have is this concept of being a trusted advisor, which really is a skills-based value that says, start, you're smart, as a creative problem solver, but start by listening. Start by understanding the problem before you leap in and try to add the value that you've got there. So that uh, Hoon talked a little bit about trust. That builds trust when you're a better listener. That's a practical guide as, as, a, as a value. It's a practical guide internally that helps collaboration, but it really helps our team members have more fun with clients who trust them better because they don't come in like that cocktail party jerk that thinks they know it all, but they actually come in as an open collaborative partner. So that that's values in action in that multi-client universe. Absolutely, I agree, I agree. And just to, just to add on to that is, is, um, is really that one of the things I, I talk to leadership is how do the core values actually show up to your day-to-day -day work? So that it isn't just words on the wall. It's like, what, what is the actual action taken from them? And then the other thing is like, core, for me, core values is like foundational, but culture is what kind of shifts around it. And it always evolves depending on where the company's at, where, what type of people are there. But the core values are, are its North Star. But just, just be aware that culture will always shift. And so you can't actually try to contain it. Um, right. If you try to contain it, it that's when you it dis, it's destroyed. And I think that's true. And again, that goes back to creatives. We need to we want to let creatives be creative, and that's part of why we're ops people is because we try to remove the barriers from them getting the work done. But I think that we're all creative at heart. I mean, we really we all came from something creative, or we're going to something creative, or we have something creative in our life, and we want to represent that. And I think that again, you know, it's. Um, I often like to think that work is a little bit like, um, you know, like a, a boat tour. This is crazy. I can't believe I'm referencing this to a big group of people. But you know, it's like you're the captain of the boat, and sometimes it's smooth sailing, and everybody's happy, and there's a party on the boat, and you've got music going, and margaritas are flowing. Or maybe this is just my imaginary world that I'm thinking of. But then you have the times where you're, you're riding the rapids, and I think having that flexibility and being able to know that we're always shifting. You know, the sands of culture are always shifting, which I think might actually have been in the description of this panel, but the idea that we need to, to ebb and flow with it, much like in many ways are, are the way we do business since the pandemic or even before, but certainly since the pandemic is we have to be agile and we have to be flexible, but having that idea that you can kind of flow with it makes a huge difference. And this ties in really closely. Oh, Scott has something to add to that. Well, I would just, I just, the session that I just gave was managing through uncertainty. So we just came out of the pandemic, which sort of made us digital and remote. And now we're going into a budgeting cycle where really nobody has clarity about what the economy is going to do for the next six, 12, 18 months. And we're all at the mercy of budget cuts because leadership, first of all, cuts marketing often first going into a recession. I'm old enough to have seen four sort of radical restructurings, right? And, and then they don't necessarily understand the value of creative operations and those internal teams when they have to make decisive cuts for the organization. And so how to communicate 
you know, the, the value in shifting culture without having your creative talent panic and leave the boat because they're feeling those winds of uncertainty, or maybe even worse, not leave, but become less productive just at the moment that you need them to be more productive. And so I think the point about shifting culture is super important as we go through the next six to 12 months, because none of us are going to have budgeting certainty. Absolutely, absolutely. And every day it changes. Uh, and as we all know, for those of us who have been in house, there's that moment where you're like, oh my God, spend it or lose it. And so we're all sort of coming to the end of our fiscal year trying to figure out, is there headcount I can add now so I don't lose it? And I think it's important to tie that again, going back to those core values that we we're talking about, making sure that you don't forget what the strategy is overall, what the core values are overall, that your culture is still the most important thing. So where you're going to spend the money that you do have, even if we're, <laughs> we're on a little bit of a spending spree, don't just go nuts in the back of the Target store, you know, make sure, or excuse me, the back of the RAI store, um, you know, make sure that you're being thoughtful about the, the changes that you're making and the people that you're adding and the, the tools that you're buying. Don't just do things in a reactionary way, still be thoughtful and keep your culture in mind. And I think this is a good place to kind of go over to one of the other topics that came up in a very big way around culture was collaboration. I mean, I think we're all talking about communication and collaboration and the importance of that. And Colleen said something on our call, which I am going to use as a mantra, probably for the next several years, which is we do it better together. And Colleen, I'd love to hear a little bit more about how creating a really cohesive and inclusive culture at REI has helped you do that even more. I know you touched on it earlier, but um, if you could expand that a little bit, that would be amazing. Yeah, absolutely. And um, lucky for me, that's one of our core values is going further together um, Perfect. Is, is really um, core to REI and um, especially in the creative space and the photo operation space. We all know there's um, a lot in the mix there, both within, you know, the culture side, but also like the operational side and relationships, I feel like are everything um really the key the key to making that collaboration successful is those relationships and the trust that Hoon and Scott were talking about earlier is um something that you really have to earn and build and build within your relationships and I think that culture of like collaboration is something you can build as a leader I feel pretty strongly about that you know, you can really set that up for your team to thrive more in a situation where there is more collaboration. And um, I think collaboration and space for everyone to have a voice and a say in the process really brings new ideas to the front of the mix. It allows us to be more nimble and more courageous about change and less fearful about testing and playing and trying things that maybe don't work out, or maybe they actually work out awesome. And uh, we just found some some new way to do something um, that's you know more fun and enjoyable for the team too. So I think it's good relationships and going back to what Scott said, listening and understanding our partners, you know, both upstream and, <clears throat> and downstream. And one thing I think has been really effective for our team to do that is to like step in other people's roles. <clears throat> right, try it out for an hour or two hours or a day and just see what it's like. Um, maybe the person that's the step before you or the step after you and building that shared respect and um, a way to have open, authentic communication. And <clears throat> I love radical candor. That's great. But you've got to make sure you do that with respect and, um, and thoughtfulness. And I think um, shared goals is also really effective with collaboration and um, just to kind of tie back to what you said with talent also, which I think of talent as talent and crew, you know, anybody that is creative and is contributing to me as talent, part of the process that's um, talent, like how you have that talent thrive and be their best self, I think is through that collaboration and conversation and discussion and finding out like, what's the way that this process or this piece of the process might make you be your best self and you produce your best work. So um, I like the comment also about it ebbing and flowing because I think it really does need to be in constant mm -hmm. um, flux and you need to constantly check in too and 
yes. see how collaboration is working or, or not working. Right. I agree. And I think it's, it's interesting what you're saying, because I think by creating this level of trust, not only with your own team, but also with, God, I'll get really corporate here, cross-functional partners or clients or whatever it may be, uh, it's that immediately helps to break down those silos that I think we're all constantly worried that either, you know, it's certainly in organizations they are very defined and in some organizations they're not, but it also removes that I think it helps to remove the, I'll just be blunt, the CYA um, tendencies. I think we all have to protect our teams and the work that we do and making sure that our, our work is, um, you know, doesn't lose its uh, integrity and its creativity and um, its authenticity while also delivering on what we need to for the end goal, you know, whether that's delivering to a client or a product or doing a you know, open heart surgery, very different than, than this. But I think that that's so important, the trust and that level of trust and authenticity throughout culture, again, will help to break down some of those silos that we often see sprouting up. And if we can keep, I don't want to say push them down, but keep them low, so that the, um, you know, it's like your next door neighbor, is their, is their fence really high? Or do you just have a small hedge that you can look over and say, hey, and I know there are days we bought both, but I think that it's very important to keep this communication and collaboration alive. And uh, Stacy, if it's okay, I'd like you to tell us a little bit because you're also in an interesting situation where again, yeah. you're a service provider, but you have, so you have internal clients, but they also look to you as the expert, as the, you know, the, the trusted advisor. And Scott, I'll, I'll turn to you afterwards because I think that this is a really interesting dynamic that you are within someone else's culture, you're, you're bringing your own culture, but you've also got this level of collaboration that you need to, that you're embedded and you need to keep um, growing that collaboration and communication. Yeah, so, um, you know, like in a certain respect, <clears throat> like um, on the one hand, it's like you're sort of seen as like a new sheriff coming into town and laying down the law in terms of certain ways of doing things. Um, so in, in our situation, you um, had a company where it was an internally run department that wasn't necessarily the most efficiently run, but it suited the needs of a certain type of workflow that they had forever. And um, so, so then we sort of came in trying to help them um, pivot and sort of look at what's going on. So, you know, like I always start from viewing us as really like we're an on-site service as opposed to we're just this department that um, you know, is there to just perform certain tasks. So that really means like collaborating like with the different departments because they are very individual in terms of their needs, as well as like on an, on sort of like a personal level, just even like talking to our creative talent, getting their input on things. And even though like we're within this sort of like big corporate environment, just sort of how we can begin to make changes and then also talk to the other teams that then we have to hand the baton off to um, in terms of the process, because really, even though like we're separate entities, we have to provide like a united and seamless um, sort of front to who it is that we're actually servicing so that they're happy with the actual outcome. And it's something that's comfortable for them, but it also respects the legacy of what it is that they're doing. Absolutely. And it's interesting. And I wondered just when you were speaking, one of the things that came up to me, to mind for me that I'd love to ask you is, you know, I, I use silo like it's a bad word, but because of the type of work that you do, you have to be very specialized because obviously, you know, photographing uh, a miniature is going to be very different than going out to a location and doing, you know, a, a really huge piece of art or a car or something else that might be um, up for auction eventually or part of the collection. So do you find that you, you know, sort of your style of communication and collaboration is specialized for the individual groups that you work with, or do you have sort of a, a similar theme throughout, or is it a combination of both? Um, I, I'd say it's definitely a combination of both. And then um, we're sort of in a unique position where there's a high degree of confidentiality involved in what it is right. that we work with as well as in some as in some instances you have like where unless that photography happens they cannot sign contracts and other sort of things that happen in the process but then part of what's offered 
with um, say going with a company like Christie's is also like our ability to be able to tell a story of a collection or a particular item in a way that sort of um, differentiates us from say going to another um, auction house. So definitely like on a project by project basis that might differ. And then also on a departmental level that might differ as well as on a client level that that will differ. And, and sometimes it's like, because of our role, it's like, we're not actually privy to any names, obviously everything is given code words and these types of things, but regardless of like what it is that we're dealing with, it's like, we, we try to treat everything the same and try to give it that same level of respect and care and communication, like within reason. That's amazing. And that goes back to the core values of your culture. I think in the, the, the care and the love that you're giving this, every single piece of art that walks in, whether I think it's, you know, again, consider the small piece of art or a big piece of art. That is remarkable. And I am always going to think of you as a member of the Mission Impossible team from now on yeah. out. So, <laughs> um, Scott, I wanted to get over to you too to talk a little bit about collaboration because that's really at the core in so many ways of, of what you do with your clients and um, finding a way to keep culture and those core values um, in sight when you're doing work together and making sure you're servicing your client, but you're also being a great partner to them. Could you talk to us a little bit about collaboration? Yeah, uh, happy to. And and that's I also agree with you, Stacey, that's like the coolest use case, really. I, I love sort of the, <laughs> the story that you just told, but I'm actually going to riff a bit off of Colleen's thought around talent, right? The collaboration, it, it, it requires being purposeful. So like Colleen, collaboration is one of our five core values. And when you're doing hiring and you're doing performance evaluation, it's really against the benchmark of how collaborative you are. And we all know creative problem solvers who are collaborative, and we all know creative problem solvers who aren't collaborative. But I see enough talent to know that there's talent in almost any role that does approach it collaboratively. So if you're purposeful from the start, those are the people that you bring in to your team, that you retain on your team, um, and that you reward with sort of the most strategic and purposeful, um, purposeful projects, right? You want to hold on to them. And then you want to find partners that really echo those values with you. And so the trusted advisor is the practical way to get there, calling reference, you know, listening as the key skill and understanding and empathizing, understanding the different roles that are involved in the production process makes you a better collaborator. Collaborator, but so does um, accountability, which is a core value for us. Understanding I need to deliver within my role, particularly within that quality budget time triangle that kills us all. And then collaboration, the way I do it is really open to supporting everyone's success on it. So you, you, you be purposeful in who you hire and you say, I don't care how talented they are. If they don't fit collaboration as one of our core values and they can't live it, they're not going to be on the team. Just and to I add think, to Scott's please. thing is, is really like how many of you have actually leaned on the talent side and not the collaborative side? And then the amount of work that you have to do to fix the problems that it creates or the amount of stress and the kind of cancer that kind of yeah. grows out of that. For me, it just, it's just not worth it. It's really to kind of find that collaborative nature uh, first, right? Nobody wants a Don Draper internally on their team or a Don Draper from their agency partner, regardless of the outcome, because you don't get to the outcome in a modern creative solution without that kind of collaboration. So yeah, you're, you're bang on. Yep, absolutely. And I, I think we have, time goes so fast when a lot of us get together and start talking, but I want to make sure that I touch on something that I think is important to everybody here, which is creativity and culture. and. I, I wanted to do this specifically also because Hoon brought something really interesting up on our call. And it is the reason that at least, and Scott, you weren't in, in the preview, but Stacy and I had our, our background zoomed out uh, or excuse me, fuzzed out so that nobody could see them. Well, the mess behind me. And uh, we got to see Stacy's cat, which was awesome. But there is something that I'd love for Hoon to talk a little bit about, which really inspired me, which is this, um, this idea of really finding out more about people in a remote world, in a digital world where we can't be together, we can't have those happy hour moments. What does it mean to be, how can we be more inclusive and inspiring and creative together in this space? 
Yeah, one of the things that I noticed, uh, especially in you know, kind of a more remote environment is really that blurring of like, who is your work self versus who is your personal self start to really blur. And you really saw that in in like these Zoom screens and, and seeing like, oh, oh wow, like, I didn't know you have a guitar as well. And so you, you start to make those connections. But another thing that we kind of talked about before is like what it what it starts to break down is it, it starts to really allow you to kind of be a little bit more authentic. You really bring in your whole authentic self. And again, it's it's all connected. It's about like if you are able to bring your whole whole self to the to the collaboration, that shows that amount of trust. And like I am trusting you by showing you my background. And so then it goes two ways. And so you really start to lay down the foundation of trust. Um, and kind of what what you talked about before is like, well, I, I need to trust myself. So it's not just trusting with collaborators. I need to trust who I am as a person. And then once you accept that, then you could actually be more open and more trust trusting of other people. So it's kind of like this whole kind of sounds very philosophical, but it's this, it's this wheel of like a self and, and, and bringing your more authentic self to, to the table. And that allows you to be more free, allows you to be more open, allows you to be more collaborative and allows you to be more creative. Absolutely. And it's interesting. I, I do work with one company where everyone is remote and it's a, it's a smaller startup. But one of the amazing things is everyone said, even though I haven't met most of the team in person and they're a global organization, I feel like they're my family. And I thought this is an incredible culture that they've created this sort of I'll call it the open door policy, but basically this this culture where if somebody needs help, they raise their hand. If someone needs to talk things through, people get together. But this is automatic for them. And I thought, God, we need to get them and write a chapter in a book about how they've done this and how can we scale this for bigger organizations. And um, Scott, you know, you're working with a lot of different creatives, both internally within your org and also with clients. Could you tell us a little bit about how you're fostering creativity as part of the culture and especially, you know, as part of the culture and in this digital time and this virtual age, if you will? Right. Yeah, it's crazy, right? Because we are really in this like little square so often. And so the way that work gets celebrated and creative work gets celebrated has to be more purposeful as well. You just don't walk by and see what's up on the screen or there something's left tacked to the board or on the rails within the presentation room or gets sort of shared around the office. You got to be more purposeful. And so right when the pandemic started, we started doing global huddles and the, you know, the agencies got hit really hard. We actually grew 100 percent over the course because of the kind of flexibility that we provide. But everybody was scared. And so we did a weekly huddle where the first message was. Our clients are fine, they love us, and we're still in business to retain and reassure and keep people just able to focus on what was important, which was creating value. That's evolved now over building a virtual community. And every, we do two ways of sharing out the work. We do a formal case study every two, so we do this huddle every Tuesday. We share work, a work example every Tuesday. And it's within the confidentiality clause of the whole company, but you get to see what other agency people are working on with other clients. So it's inspirational, it showcases the work, it showcases excellent. And we allow, we have this super awkward, I love the awkward silence. Because it gets everybody's attention and it really opens up conversation. And so we use awkward silence during that huddle for people to do individual shout outs about their own project or people that they've worked with. And so that's created a ton. We, like everybody else, have moved into um, uh, collaboration tools. And so for us, our internal tool is Workplace, which is the, the meta tool. Um, they're a client that we do a ton of work with. So we sort of adopted their tool set. But within that, we're also posting the same work wins that are happening there. And then the final piece is a, a tool called Bonus Sleep, where people can individually give each other shout outs that come with sort of a point system that can then be cashed in for rewards that are unique to everyone else and get celebrated over the channel of who is shouting out each other. And so it's organic. It's about the work um, and it is inspirational. But most importantly, it's been adopted. 
you, that's so many in so many ways the magic word. I think with culture and with any sort of changes that are happening, um, adoption is so key because if people don't believe that it's authentic and if people don't believe that it's going to stick around and this is, oh, this is this season's thing, then their interest in spending time to really embrace it, you know, it's kind of like taking the air out of the balloon. And uh, I know we're already closing in on time. So somebody actually asked a question, which I, I think is, is really interesting. And I'd like to tie into that, which is um, how can someone within the organization that does not have power begin to change or influence the culture of an organization? And I'm sure you all can speak about this. Does anybody want to go first? Um, I, I came from film and had to deal with a lot of high powered film people and talent. And what I found out is like, people are people, people are human. So you may think that you don't have power, but just make that connection, reach out. Um, and 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 a lot, of, a lot of what I do, especially with leadership is a lot of times leaders are asking like, I'll, um, you know, what can I do? The leader's like, oh, what's the problem? What can I fix? But very rarely does that get flipped to the leader of like, well, how are you doing? How, as a leader, are you doing? And that just by opening that door, it creates an, a, a, a creates a connection. And so they then they're like, oh, no one's ever asked me that before. And so there's power in that by just just reaching out and saying, how are you as a leader? How are you doing? Um, and then the second thing is like model that behavior. Um, one of the things I give as a tip and trick for like Zoom meetings, like a lot of times, like we have that awkward silence of everyone joining and it's like completely silent. Unmute yourself and just say, hey, um, where are you located? And just start to make those connections because we don't have those water cooler moments to really meet outside the meeting room. So this is your one opportunity because pretty much at the end of the Zoom, people just pop off. Like all agenda's done, okay, I'm leaving. So it's that one little minuscule moment to really kind of try to make a connection with other people. Um, if I can piggyback onto yeah. that. Um, so like another lifetime ago, I was in hospitality. <laughs> And um, so with different corporations, uh, especially like for a guest experience, you would have a percentage of people even that you would have to say hello to, regardless of whether they reacted to you or not. And that's something that's always sort of stayed with me. So even like, uh, you know, it's like, say like three years ago when I began working um, at Christie's, even I, I always make it a point to say hello to people and try to be friendly, like those little sort of personal touches um, just to begin to create those connections. And if they choose to respond to me, if they just look at me funny, like I really don't care because a lot of the time it's like that sort of personal touch can get um, lost. And, uh, and you would be amazed that eventually the, the person that just sort of ignores you all of a sudden, if just for a second, you don't say hello, they're like, oh, hello. And um, you know, it's like just sort of just bringing like back in the human aspect to what it is that we do because we can get very lost in hitting certain benchmarks and um, shot counts and all sorts of things and sort of trying to keep in mind that at the end of the day it's like we're all human beings and that we need to you know sort of like work together and recognize that we're human beings while having to complete the tasks that we have at hand. And I think that's Stacy what what you said I really like and and it it ties into another question that came up, but if anybody else wants to address this one, I'm happy to pause and, okay. I'll roll right into this one. Um, we're all using a lot of freelance talent or contractors or consultants these days. And this, I thought this was a great question, which is how do you try to maintain a company culture of values with so many contractors uh, in your creative and studio space? Uh, our, this particular person says that our company sends out many communications to build a specific culture, but the contractors don't get them. How do you communicate out those values to um, independent contractors, to freelancers, et cetera? Anybody want to weigh in? Um, just oh. in a small way. Sorry, Colleen, do you want to go? Oh, no, go ahead, Stacey. I'll go after oh, Okay, I, I was just going to quickly say, like, um, I always make it a point that even like with those types of emails, I personally forward that just like, hey, today is donut day or just any of those little sort of um, things to make sure that they can feel included because 
sometimes it can feel purposeful that they're being excluded and just those sort of little um touches because like i myself am a contractor working for a contractor even though i feel closely tied to the client that i'm embedded with um and just even with other contractors if they don't get those communications i make it a point to include them as well because you know it's like you never know when you might need someone or they might need you but then that's what sort of just gives a human touch to things awesome yeah, plus plus one on that, but I'll just add, I think it's kind of tricky, you know, and having been much like Stacy on sort of both um, sides of that coin, having been a contractor inside of, you know, my client's <clears throat> house in the past and now being, you know, the client with quite a few contractors, I think that is like a tricky balance to find and um, kind of requires refinement and work and what messages you can pass along or you know if there are events contractors can't be part of like what can you create that they can be and like what mm -hmm. um <clears throat> opportunities can you find for for creating that culture amongst the team you know contractor or full-time to continue to bond together i think is something um, i try to work on constantly and i think it's a a tough balance to find but really like kind of checking in with people and seeing where they're at and if they feel connected or disconnected i think helps to tell you as a leader like what how you need to adjust their point yeah i i love that thought that and i i, I just add added to be purposeful around it you know one of the we ask four questions when we're trying to figure out um, what the right resourcing model is for our clients needs it's what's the work, how much work is there, what are the skills? But the fourth question is, what's the level of integration and collaboration that that person's gonna need? Do they need to be part of the culture? Um, and so Stacey, you know, you're, you're part of the culture, you're living the culture, you're fully embedded and part of that communication stream. Or is it something at scale where in fact, it's gonna work in a much more traditional agency contractor where, where the, the work just needs to get briefed get done and come back in again and deeper understanding of the players and the culture isn't necessary then you don't you actually don't want to go through the the the, the challenge of sharing information and deciding what's proprietary or not proprietary and how to share it so it, it's really strategically asking the question what's the level of integration that's needed for this role and then building the role that way and just one last thing to add to that is like if you're getting pushback, but you feel like, no, they're a part of the team, push push back with HR or whoever your talent partners are. Because a lot of time they'll they'll skirt on the side of being safe, yeah. but sometimes safe is not being inclusive. And so like, there have been times where like, oh, we push a pack and then like, oh yeah, th this totally makes sense. Give them the context. Again, ask the questions. If you don't ask the questions then nothing's gonna change. Right, absolutely. Awesome. All right, we've gone a couple minutes over, so hopefully everybody has stayed with us, but I just want to say thank you so much. Is there anything anyone would like to add before I give my uh, five minute uh, uh, outro here? <laughs> nope. Okay, I'll go right into it. Thank you everyone for coming today. Uh, this is the last session for uh, Photo Studio Ops Forum, and I think for the Festival of Creative Ops. I can't believe we have had our second virtual event. It's amazing. I'm so excited that everybody was able to be here. And uh, that wraps up for this year. So again, thank you all so much for joining us. And a um, couple things I'd like to mention, if you'd like to continue uh, diving into some of these topics and uh, into topics that move the needle for you and your organization, uh, please join me for an upcoming webinar series that I'm doing with the fantastic people at Henry Stewart and a number of amazing speakers, content creation from brief to deliverable. And we're going to be exploring the current state of content creation, as well as tactics and strategy to help you optimize content production as we move to the future. And I'm very happy to announce that I am going to be joined by the BrainWriter team uh, for we have a webinar coming up with them on people, process and technology, finding success through flexibility. That's going to be on Thursday, November 10th. And you can learn more and sign up at henrystewartconferences.com. Uh, don't forget, also, we are back in person. Um, I think LA Creative Ops is coming up. Then we've got Creative and Photo Studio Ops in London in March, in New York in May, and LA in October again. So we've got LA October 
for creative ops this year. And next year, I believe that we're going to have photo studio ops out there as well. Uh, but head over to henrystewartconferences.com or check out their LinkedIn page for more information and to take advantage of all their fabulous special offers. And uh, just a reminder that all the session recordings from today's events are accessible on the agenda tab. Uh, and then I think that things go up on YouTube after a week or so. Uh, but do check out Creative Ops Pros, Photo Studio Ops Pros, all of those uh, groups on um, LinkedIn. So I just want to say in closing, thank you again so much to everyone for coming. Thanks to our fabulous panelists for talking about culture with me. I think we have about another 10 hours of information we'd like to share. So let's do this again soon. And thank you to all of our fabulous sponsors for making today so special. And uh, to the Henry Stewart team for being the easiest group of people to work with. We love and adore you. Um, and I'd just like to say thank you from me and everybody have a great day and uh, we'll see you again soon. Bye.